My name is Barry Colfer, and I'm the Director of Research here at the Institute of International and European Affairs in Dublin. It's my enormous pleasure to welcome you to this webinar discussion on digital assistive technology as a key enabler to assisted living, where we're going to be regaled by Dr. Cahill Morgan, who works for the WHO Regional Office for Europe, leading the workforce optimization agenda within the health workforce and service delivery team. It's my real pleasure, firstly, to introduce a friend of the Institute and a very well-known person in Irish academic circles and indeed European and wider afield academic circles too, Delia Ferry, who is going to be chairing the discussion today. Delia is a professor of law at Maynooth University and is co-director of the Assisting Living and Learning ALL All Institute. Delia is a member of the Maynooth University Social Sciences Institute and is a fellow of the Maynooth Centre for European and Eurasian Studies. There is much besides in Delia's um, remarkable uh, CV I could talk about, but I'll just mention for the purpose of this discussion, Delia is the primary investigator on the European Research Council ERC funded dancing project, which explores the rights of persons with disabilities to take part in cultural life as an essential aspect of enhancing cultural diversity in the EU. So I can't think of a better person to be engaged in conversation with Carl today. And without further ado, many thanks Delia and I hand you the floor. Thank you very much, Barry, for this very generous presentation. It's a great pleasure for me to be here today. Good morning, everyone. I'm very pleased to welcome all of you to this uh, webinar on digital assistive technology as a key enabler to assisted living. Uh, we are delighted to, to be joined today by Dr. Cathal Morgan, who has been generous enough to take the time uh, out of his very busy schedule to speak to us. Um, before introducing Dr. Morgan, I just want to mention a couple of, of issues in relation to uh, the roadmap of this uh, seminar. So Dr. Mor Morgan will speak to us for about 20 minutes, and then we will have a Q&A uh, answer uh, session. Uh, in this session, you will be using the Q&A function that is at the bottom of your screen. So feel free to include a question in that, uh, um, using that function on Zoom. You should see that function on the screen. Um, I will read the questions uh, uh, for you and uh, I hope we will have an insightful and lively debate uh, after Dr. Morgan presentation. Um, I just want to remind you that both the presentation and the Q&A session that will follow are recorded. Feel free to join the discussion on Twitter and you can handle, uh, um, use the handle uh, IIEA and uh, we are also live streaming uh, the discussion on YouTube. So you can follow us on many different tools and platforms. Now, without further ado, I would like to formally introduce Dr. Cathal Morgan. Dr. Morgan works for the WHO Regional Office for Europe, is a leading, leading the workforce optimization agenda within the health workforce and service delivery team. Before his current WHO role, Dr. Morgan provided policy and technical advisory support to governments in scaling access to rehabilitation, digital and assistive technologies with a key technical role in advising on disability inclusive health policies. He has held several senior leadership positions within Ireland's public service, including as head of the disability operation in the HSC. He has worked with international organizations such as the International Initiative for Disability Leadership and the EU Equal Initiative. Cathal is a trained clinical psychotherapist with a master's degree in clinical psychotherapy, a PhD in clinical research relating to suicidology, and a postgraduate diploma in executive leadership coaching. So is a very experienced person with a wealth of knowledge on assistive technology, and I'm delighted to give him the floor. 
Thank you, Delia. Welcome, thank Kato. you. Yeah, thank you for that very kind introduction. And whilst I'm sharing my screen, I also want to thank sincerely our colleagues in the Irish Institute of European Affairs for this fantastic opportunity to talk about something which is actually quite a passion for me. Um, and the topic being how access to digital, digital and assistive technologies really is a game changer in relation to enabling people to live life to its full potential. So as uh, Dili was saying, we're gonna take kind of around 20 minutes or thereabouts for me to say what I think is important in relation to setting the scene and setting the context. In particular, um, when I talk a little bit about defining what we mean by assistive technologies, um, I want to maybe just talk a little bit about what the data is telling us around what that need looks like both now, but also into the future. More importantly, and you'll know from reading the uh, context for this webinar, Ireland actually is beginning to now take a more global role in relation to providing leadership in this space. So it recently signed a global agreement with the World Health Organization um, as a strategic partner in implementing what's called the Global Report on Access to Assistive Technologies. So I'll describe what that is, why it's important, and then more importantly, to bring it back home, in other words, to talk a little bit about whilst we can absolutely play a global role, we've a lot of work to do in our own country here as well in relation to really enabling the wider ecosystem of what's required to support all peoples to maximize their independence. So I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the initiative that I'm currently involved in, which is the collaboration with the WHO Regional Office for Europe. So when we talk about, um, you know, what, what is ultimately our goal? What is our, I suppose, ultimate vision? Um, when we talk about access to digital and assistive technologies, we're really talking about strengthening equitable access to assistive technology and harnessing the potential of digital technology across what we call these five interconnected pillars for access. So that's to do with people being at the center, policy, products, and personnel. And in that context, what we would say um, is important um, is to think about how, how do we actually define what we mean by assistive technology? Because for those who live and work in the Irish scene, we're familiar with the terminology that's used, often referring to the aids and appliances, um, particularly the scheme that operates within the health service executive. But actually globally uh, and through the World Health Assembly, we have defined what we mean by this. So when we talk about assistive technology, what we are defining it is, 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 is being an umbrella term for assistive products and their related systems and services. So that's important, and I will address this in more detail as I move along. We need to think about it more than just having a product. And why is it important? Well, it maximizes people's potential um, um, and maximizes people's um, um, capacity to be as independent as possible in the number of human domains, uh, which you can see in the screen here. So whether it's about making sure that we can support people in, in communication, in cognition, in, in hearing, mobility, self-care, and vision. And you, you can say that assistive products are one of four groups of health products that should be available through what we would call universal health coverage. And these six streams of products, and you can see the types or range of products that are typically associated with each of these human domains here. Um, these are what we would say as being important in terms of what people should be getting access to. Now, I will say that when you look at the, the products here, I'm not suggesting that this is the totality of the list because, you know, products and particularly digital innovation is increasingly um, moving at a rapid pace. So the capacity to be able to provide these types of supports is growing exponentially. So from a policy point of view, and we would always say from the WHO perspective that in not only achieving universal health coverage, getting access to these products and the associated services is actually a human right. And we very much heavily embed this policy approach in the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. And without this, we're not achieving universal health coverage and we're not fully adhering to the various articles in the UN Convention as well. 
And to remind ourselves again, when we talk about um, this from a strategic or a vision point of view, we tend to see it in the context of what we call the 5P framework. In other words, if governments and state agencies and people who are accessing or feeding into the design of these initiatives are going to take this uh, in, in the serious way in which it, it, it deserves, we have to be thinking about it in five ways. In other words, there needs to be a design set of actions that addresses five specific areas. Obviously, the person being at the centre and I will stress that actually in our lifetime, we are all going to need access to one or more forms of assistive technology products. I don't need them um, here now because the screen is right in front of me, but something as simple as eye glasses being one example. If I didn't have this, I would be struggling, you know, and that's just one example of how important it is to have access to products. But we need to think about it more than just a product. We need to think about the personnel, in other words, the workforce that's there to provide services to meet people's needs as well. From the point of view of setting the context or setting the scene, I want to talk a little bit about what the need is. So um, in a couple of years ago, we did launch a report that's called the Great Report, the Global Report um, on Assistive and Digital Technologies. And we've estimated that today even, approximately 2.5 billion of the world's population needs access to one or more forms of assistive technology, just one in three people. But actually, when you start to look at that trajectory over the years ahead, and this will become important in the Irish context when I address this in a few slides later, that's only going to keep growing. And even today, that 2.5 billion kind of marker is, I would say, an underestimate. But we do think about this from the point of view of it, the need growing exponentially over the years ahead. And you can see from this slide, we estimate that by 2050, up to 3.5 billion people will need access to one or more forms of assistive technologies. Now, obviously, when you look at the graph, the need for eye care, the need for uh, spectacles is uh, a very significant feature in relation to needing access to products. But that shouldn't under undermine or underestimate the other forms of needs that we also will have, which you'll see by this graph here. So what are the key kind of challenges um, that we are seeing when it comes to um, um, access issues, when it comes to creating the, the necessary environment to provide for people's needs? Well, one of the key barriers or one of the key challenges is inequity. And we know that in some settings, perhaps only 3% of people have access to assistive technologies. And I think it's important to maybe make this distinction that, you know, even within high income countries, it is not the case that people who need access to these products and services are getting access. So even though a country may be quite wealthy, it is the case that actually there are significant equity barriers for people um, from various groups getting access to products. You can't assume that if a country has the economic wherewithal that actually people are getting the access that they need. That's an important piece. And obviously there are huge swathes or vast countries or regions across the globe that have very significant challenges, particularly in developing countries. Aging is a key factor, obviously, and that's important from the perspective of the rising trajectory of need that I talked about um, um, earlier. So two out of three people aged over 60 need at least one assistive product. Access is a huge um, factor when it comes to um, getting access to pro getting access to products. Um, and very often we find um, that financial the financial burden and hardship associated with the cost of products is a significant factor. Now, that's important from a couple of policy perspectives. One is, is, is in terms of how government schemes can address that through social protection or through health-related schemes. But also, we would say how the industry side can play its role in relation to making sure that products are more affordable. So it, it, it has two significant dimensions to it when it comes to access. Barriers from the perspective of, again, um, awareness is a key factor. Often um, in, in lots of countries, including in Ireland, um, the awareness factor is quite significant in terms of, well, what kinds of products that are, that are out there that I don't know about that maybe I could be accessing that would make a difference to my independence or my capacity to function in everyday life. And we often find when we do our capacity assessments, 
um, and we're doing one here in Ireland at the moment, that's a significant feature in relation to people simply not being aware. Unfortunately and regrettably, we still live in a world, obviously, where crisis, whether it's environmental or natural disasters, but also humanitarian crisis associated with conflict and war in our own region here in the context of what's happening in Ukraine um, has a significant impact on the lives of people in relation to need to access to a products, need to be able to ensure that countries are prepared that when a disaster happens, that actually access not only to health and care services, but also products, assisted products, actually becomes the ordinary thing to do. And often we find that countries are not that well prepared when it comes to humanitarian crisis in relation to having these kinds of pipeline um, access to products being available to people when they need it at the point in time they need it. I referred earlier to the 2.4 up to 3.5 billion year, um, 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 numbers of people that may need access over the years ahead, but actually we, you know, the data is much more broader in, in scope in relation to that. So for example, in the European context, when I talk about the European context, I'm representing a region that includes the European Union countries stretching right into Central Asia. When we looked um, a couple of years ago at the global burden of disease, and when you think about re access to rehabilitation services, we also find that there's a very significant need in relation to access to these kinds of services. So 394 million people were estimated to have a health condition that would have benefited from rehabilitation. And you can see here from this slide that the kind of driving causes in relation to that in terms of health conditions um, straddles a number of health condition areas. And I want to point out in particular the very high prevalence of musculoskeletal disorders, particularly when this, within this region. So it's just over 64%. And we know, you know, that the, the is a close connection between the need for access to services, particularly rehabilitation services, and the combined need to assistive technology. So look, this is just me saying that, look, we have a sufficient level of data to tell us that we have a significant level of unmet need today. We know what the driving causes are, and we know that that's only going to grow and get bigger as, as the years uh, move on, unless we get prepared quickly. So this brings us to the Irish dimension. So I mentioned earlier in my presentation that Ireland has now entered in a into a formal global agreement now with the World Health Organization. And that agreement actually, which and I'm proud to say um, is actually going to be funding a number of very powerful initiatives that will help all countries to be able to plan for and scale access to assistive te technologies. So even at that kind of global level in terms of putting money and investment in and actually just stepping forward as a very small country in making its mark, um, Ireland is actually doing quite a lot in this space, particularly most recently. And you can see that that is falling into a number of discrete um, activity areas. In other words, addressing some of the some of the key challenges and barriers that I had mentioned earlier around advocacy and awareness, around um, helping member states identify what kinds of products they should be providing for people, and actually working with industry. So we would see from a WHO perspective that we need to be involved with industry around making products being more accessible in terms of universal design features, making products being more affordable so that member states can wisely invest in this area. And also finally, in relation to supporting um, each member state in developing their own action plans and strategies. So this kind of planned a program of action that's been taken as a result, a direct result of Ireland's um, um, initiative is actually going to be so beneficial um, more globally as well as uh, back at home as well. And one example is in relation to the um, what we call the WHO Global Goods, the technical products. So we was always advocate the need for there having to be a set of products, and in other words, a defined list that can be clearly identified as being the kinds of products that should be in place for citizens to be able to access as a matter of course in their own country. And we would say that that's an important feature in relation to um, achieving universal health coverage. As I mentioned before, digital um, um, dimensions or digital in innovations um, are becoming a more significant feature of assistive technologies now. 
So apart from the traditional kind of products that we we know well, whether it be either powered wheelchairs or access to um, um, hearing aids or visual aids or cognitive aids, more and more software and digital components are becoming um, much more a feature of day-to-day -day life for all of us, including people who have a need um, for um, specific and prescribed access to assistive technologies. And we will be now working on a second list, in other words, a, an assistive priority product list, a mark two, and um, that we will be advocating for countries to actually implement um, in this area. So moving on, <clears throat> I'm going to now address the um, aspect to do with national, regional and global products. So we will be um, specifically addressing the issue of digital technology uh, in relation to people, policy, products, provision and personnel. So we're going to be developing specifications, policy briefs for countries that will try and tackle some of those key issues that are uh, facing each country, including the use of some of the more challenging aspects of digital technologies, including the use of artificial technology. And we say that very much coming from uh, uh, two perspectives. One is a rights-based approach. And secondly, coming from the perspective of making sure that access to these new technologies, whether it's AI or otherwise, actually have a meaningful impact in, in relation to addressing people's needs in terms of becoming as independent as possible. So that brings me to the Irish dimension. So I had mentioned earlier that the WHO and Ireland have this global initiative that's happening now. But as I said in my opening remarks, Ireland itself has a lot to do. And I'm happy to say that we are beginning to approach this now from a much more systemic structured point of view. And this brings us to a number of planned activities that we're actually delivering as we speak. In fact, this morning before this webinar, uh, we're implementing a capacity assessment, which I'll talk about a little bit more, where we're, as we speak now, we're talking to people who are accessing and using products to try and make sure that we gain their views and valuable insights into what will make a difference for them. So actively going out onto the ground, into services, and actually talking to people who use products in relation to what does, what does Ireland need to do? What does my community need to do? What does my local service need to do? Bring it back down to the person's level that would actually make a difference to my life. And that's where we're now looking inwards to Ireland, where we're now looking at three specific activities. But before I do that, I do want to, because often ministries of health and ministries of social protection are particularly faced with the kind of this issue around, well, you know, what will the investment do? And actually, we would say that the investment in this area is is really a smart thing to do. I mean, there have been economic studies carried out in this area, one of which we we work um, um, and rely on quite closely with our colleagues in what's called the AT Scale Global Partnership for Assistive Technology. And very simply, just if you look at the screen here, we've been able to identify that for every $1 um, in US dollars of investment, there's a $9 return to the, to, the, to the economy, in other words. So when you strip that back and look at it from a very human point of view, if children are getting access to their education because, and because they're getting access to products that help them participate, if people are getting into the labor force, if people are actually able to return to work um, by virtue of having access to products that support them in doing that, this all has a very significant um, impact, not just for the individual, not just for the community, but also for the economy as well. And we're saying that um, from an investment point of view, it makes sense to uh, make these kinds of investments. So specifically, what will Ireland be doing um, in relation to this initiative that we're working um, with, particularly the Ministry of Health and the Department of Children, Disability, Equality, Integration and Youth? And there are three strands of activities, essentially. One is we're actually actively now doing what's called a country assessment um, of what the current situation is in relation to assistive technology. We will be working on the workforce dimension, and I want to elaborate that in some detail because we have very significant challenges when it comes to access to the to the workforce that's required to support people. And we will also be working with Ireland on delivering um, two global workforce conferences and expos, um, which will be held um, hopefully in Dublin in the years ahead as well. So let's define a little bit more about what I mean by each of those streams of work. So the what we call the ATAC, the Assistive Technology Capacity Assessment. And going back to the five Ps I'd mentioned before, we're now in the throes of doing a capacity assessment that really does a deep dive into what's the current situation in Ireland when it comes to policy, products, personnel, provision, and people 
when it comes to assistive technology. And why do we say that's important? We say it's important because if you don't have a baseline from which to measure where the country is at currently, it makes it much more challenging and, uh, and um, um, practically impossible to plan to improve the situation. So this capacity assessment, which is happening now and hopefully will be completed within quarter one of next year, is about developing how we regulate finance, procure, and provide assistive technology to meet population need. So that will become important, not just from a budgetary planning point of view, but obviously the report itself, particularly for the next government, um, will become important from a policy point of view. And what it aims to achieve is, is to understand the current situation, which I've mentioned before. So the second initiative is the optimization, the workforce side of things around scaling access to both digital and assistive technologies for two specific reasons. Okay, the driver behind this is it is really important and really good that we scale access to these products for people in need, but without access to the services around that. So I'm talking about the health and care services that are needed, whether it's access to speech and language therapy, access to prosthetics and orthotic services, access to um, specialized um, seating services, without having those professional disciplines being available, it negates the other, if that makes sense. So we can't ignore the workforce dimension to this. And there are significant challenges when it comes to that, which I'll address very shortly. But we have two specific actions in this area. Once, one is about strengthening continuing professional development to equip the workforce with new knowledge and competencies. So. It is the case that even in today, when we look at even at the curriculum that's available for disciplines, whether it's occupational therapy or phys physical therapy or physical rehabilitation medicine, there's a lot more we can do around raising the competency and the, the knowledge base around what we mean by assistive technologies, what we mean about implementing um, schemes in this area, what we mean about raising the training capacity of people working in this area. And the second is addressing specifically the health and care workforce um, side of things. So there's no doubt but that we have to focus on how do we optimize the capacity and the availability of the existing workforce to be able to respond to people's needs as well. So that's the, the, the other dimension of the action area that we'll be addressing. And I want to labor the point, if you don't mind, colleagues, in relation to this, because we've often described it um, as a ticking time bomb, particularly in the European region. We are facing unprecedented challenges when it comes to the workforce. And that's why when we think about assistive products and digital enablers, we have to think broadly beyond the person's need to the wider ecosystem and the workforce that's required. And we need to recognize that we have a challenge in relation to that. So that's why we talk about in this agreement, in this kind of activities that, that we're implementing about optimizing the conditions of and the contribution of the health and care workforce. Well, why is that happening? Well, go back to the data that I showed you before. Healthcare uh, activity and demand versus the actual capacity and availability of the workforce in terms of numbers, in terms of disciplines, in terms of competencies, one is outweighing the other. Trajectory is going in a very different way. And we know as the population um, aging uh, is accelerating, particularly in the European region, we're faced with a huge dilemma. In other words, we have thankfully people living longer, but with more chronic conditions and with more chronic conditions, comes more need for access to products and services and a professional workforce. And unfortunately, we are living in a climate where one is going this way. In other words, the trajectory of need and the availability of the workforce is going the opposite direction. So we need to be able to think literally outside the box and strategize and mitigate in relation to how we could actually use um, um, access to these products in a more wiser way so that we can strengthen the workforce. And you'll see this slide before you is just literally demonstrating what I think everyone already knows, in other words, in terms of what's contributing to the shortages of getting access to workers. And um, so we have a huge attrition problem in terms of um, aging, in terms of migration, in terms of demand, in terms of people being burnt out, people's own mental health and working in services, all driving this shortage issue, which you can see here before you. And at the same time, demand going this way. So I'm literally just strengthening my argument around the trajectory of need versus the uh, capacity of the workforce almost going in different directions, in opposite directions. So we need to think differently in relation to and plan for how we provide for people, but also to strengthen the workforce. 
So when we talk about optimization, um, we're talking about a plan, the collaborative intervention that responds to challenges in healthcare. And, and literally there are three dimensions to this. One is about care, secondly about accountability, and then thirdly, how do we use the resources that are available to us? And I want to say very specifically, when I talk about kind of the use of artificial technologies, the use of kind of digital enablers, et cetera, et cetera, that is not an argument for, and nor should it be allowed to be an argument for a replacement for the workforce. At the end of the day, we all require and depend on human interventions in relation to building relationship and trust in relation to services that are provided. That will always be the case. However, we need to be prepared from the point of view of the capacity for governments to sustain and fund a workforce um, purely just looking at it from a labour point of view needs to be understood in the context of what can we do to use technology in a wiser, smarter way that frees up the capacity of that workforce. So I've given you some um, um, examples there in terms of activities that could be um, and will be implemented in the Irish context in that regard. And that brings us then to the final activity, um, which I'm particularly excited about, because I think it's, again, another example where Ireland can take a very strong leadership role, and particularly for a small country like Ireland. We already know that we do a lot in this space in terms of our contribution to development aid. But from an Irish point of view, we also know that we are the, land, we are the country that actually um, has a very significantly advanced and educated workforce. We are head quartering most of the kind of major pharmaceutical medicine and tech companies um, um, globally here in Ireland. So we have a unique opportunity, I think, to exploit that in a way which tries to bring together uh, countries from around the globe um, into this conference space to look at what are the kinds of policies and strategies we should be implementing now 50, 100 years later. And how can we partner and work with technology companies and the industry side, again, to address what I had mentioned before, which is, look, how can we, we be more innovative around products that actually optimize people's capacity to live independently, whilst at the same time, products and services that could actually improve the contribution that a workforce will make and their conditions as well, their employment conditions as well. So that, um, Delia, brings me to the end of the input that I want to provide. Um, and I'm going to leave the presentation there um, and hand it back to you, if that's okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm.